Welcome to this fireside chat on China's opening up, its resilience and its sustainability. My name is Simon Cox. I'm an emerging markets editor for The Economist uh, based in Hong Kong. And I'm joined uh, by Thomas Fang, who's the head of China Global Markets at UBS. Uh, Thomas, welcome. Um, there's been lots of talk about decoupling between China and the US. And of course, it's very ironic because for a long time, China has sought to be semi-detached from global financial markets. Now there seems to be something of a reversal of roles where China seems quite keen on opening up financially and America seems to be having some doubts about the advisability of those links. Um, can we start? I, I know that you've been shut out by the pandemic from the mainland since Chinese New Year, but I understand you've just spent five years, uh, sorry, you've just spent five days uh, doing a tour of the mainland, um, your first visit for many months. So what were your impressions? Well, first of all, um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Yes, uh, I just uh, finished uh, the five weeks trip uh, back to the mainland China. It, it is uh, so impressed in terms of the, you know, the activities uh, in terms of economics, right? So the malls are, are full and it's hard to get, um, you know, restaurant booking um, and the hotel is, you know, is fully packed even uh, over the weekends. And one of the the most impressive part, uh, impressive part is uh, uh, when I met the policymaker. They are, you know, co more committed than ever in terms of uh, um, executing their capital markets reform and then continue the the open up strategies. And uh, to to answer your earlier questions. Uh, there are decoupling uh, talk more from, uh, uh, in my view, the geopolitical front, but in terms of the economics, especially for the financial sector, actually the coupling uh, is is really uh, what's happening. And what's motivating that, both on the Chinese side and from the point of view of the rest of the world? Sure, I think for China to achieve the the next phase of growth. Uh, as the leader has set out uh, a couple of weeks ago in terms of the, uh, their 14th uh, five-year plan. So they need to find a new engine. It will not be uh, continue to be the uh, sort of the debt-led um, growth, but they need to uh, really utilize the capital markets. At the same time, to increase the service sector productivity, especially the financial sector productivity. So they are looking at global uh, leading financial institution to come into China, set up the presence, show their best practice so that to increase uh, their overall service sector, specifically financial sector productivity. But for global financial institution, it is really both the alpha and also the business growth. Uh, by talking to the leading uh, you know, CIOs, uh, they definitely agree. So China are one of the few um, um, factors can generate alpha. At the same time, to look at the growth for their business, China is definitely the place to be uh, with growing uh, as an under management uh, uh, institutionalization and also more equity and a fixed income uh, investment opportunities. And why is it, do you think, that foreigners can generate alpha in China? Why isn't it the domestic players that will steal those investment opportunities? Actually, both. So they are actually uh, learning and uh, interacting together. It, it is not uh, mutually uh, exclusive, I think. But for global investor, uh, what is the uh, the catalyst was really many major um, index uh, added China into their overall global benchmark. So that leads to overall, um, you know, a must to look into the China equities and the fixed income market. And at the same time, for global investor, it is the uh, the beauty of uh, diversification. They need to look at geographically how to uh, diversify their portfolio. And China being the second largest uh, uh, equity and the fixed income market, both uh, in terms of uh, the size and the liquidity, is a must for them to consider. But the index inclusion, uh, diversification, both of those imply a somewhat passive uh, exposure to China. Um, do you think foreigners should be brave enough to uh, explore more active participation and why should they have an edge? Um, uh, overall, um, both passive and active manager 
uh, are uh, looking for a um, global benchmark to, to position their uh, asset allocations. But uh, you are right, 50% uh, of the, the overall, uh, I think, uh, inflow, we will categorize more index uh, follower or, or passive. But for active, they are putting in money. Uh, ever since, uh, for example, uh, MSCI inclusion uh, in 2017, the overall uh, foreign holding for the China equity market have increased four and a half times just over that uh, three year period. So that includes both passive uh, and also increasingly uh, active managers, um, including Quan Fund as well. And do you think that they um, bring something to the table that uh, local players don't have? Oh, definitely. Um, I think uh, um, one of the key things I think, um, you know, Chinese uh, industry leader love to do is uh, learn from the best. And, and if you look at any dimension in terms of, um, you know, tracking, uh, track records, uh, AUM and, and other methodologies and a global uh, asset manager are definitely uh, the leaders. Uh, they come in um, to share with uh, their overall investment and a risk management uh, philosophy, but at the same time, uh, mutually uh, learning uh, from domestic uh, institutions in terms of how do they uh, analyze uh, specific sectors, um, growth, and how their valuation, um, you know, different, even in the quant space, uh, exchange uh, talent model and the factors uh, to, in many ways to, to enhance uh, a return on growth uh, uh, at the same time. Now, uh, I mean, China used to be quite sort of suspicious of what it saw as fancy finance and you know, sophisticated financial strategies that perhaps it didn't fully uh, understand. Um, what's precipitated the change in view on China's part? Uh, there are quite a few factors. I think from uh, policymakers' uh, point of view, I think what really uh, changed um, and their perception of global investor was uh, 2018, uh, when it had a very difficult year from an um, equity investment perspective and, and with a major uh, downtrend for that particular year. Um, but for that particular year, there are two factors. Uh, there are massive uh, foreign inflows uh, into that uh, Chinese uh, equity and uh, bond market. Uh, at the same time, there, you know, the financial instrument like futures and, and some of the hedging strategy um, in many ways uh, help the market. So the policymaker in many ways realized, uh, you know, global investor can be very helpful and then financial instrument can be risk management and the price discovery. Uh, at the same time, you know, they come in with a little bit more uh, confidence uh, with the growth of, of the size of the economy and also the general uh, capital markets with uh, relatively healthy return now two years in a row um, and also uh, attracting both uh, fixed income uh, and also equity investors uh, globally. Do you think there's a ceiling on how well uh, China's authorities will let foreign investors do in China, how big foreign financial firms can get? Do you think authorities have some sense of uh, a ceiling that they're comfortable with? Yeah, that's a, a great question. And I think like uh, any um, domestic uh, regulator, um, there is always uh, this, uh, you know, two-prong approach where uh, to attract, uh, you know, global leaders, but at the same time, uh, in some way, uh, protect uh, the, the domestic players, right? So we definitely see uh, policies around uh, setting up uh, what they call, um, you know, super uh, players uh, within, you know, financial sectors such as uh, investment banks uh, and, and increasingly um, you know, insurance and uh, wealth management uh, company. But at the same time, I think it, this is really uh, at the earliest stage of uh, structural growth. Uh, so I categorize this as a sort of a, a golden decade for capital markets open up. So for foreign ownership, uh, even with that uh, increasing um, velocity, uh, of investment, the overall holding uh, as a percentage of uh, free flow, for example, for stock market, grow from 2% to somewhere around 8%. So it's four times growth, but still it's 8% uh, only. I think at some point, uh, this will uh, become a, a equilibrium where uh, how a policymaker will balance uh, both the domestic and the global, but I think we are far from there. 
And you, know, you mentioned the uh, importance that China's leadership places on financial reform in its growth strategy. Um, do you think it's right to place that much importance on financial reform? Uh, this may sound like a silly question, but is it really the financing side of China that's the binding constraint on growth? Uh, or is it really the non-financial corporations that need to change? Uh, I mean, to put the question more crisply, um, can we achieve anything with financial reform if we don't get more thoroughgoing market and SOE reform? You definitely um, um, you know, asked one of the critical questions. When we interact with a different policymaker, especially outside of the financial industry, so they care more about um, real economy. They often question how would uh, various uh, financial reform and foreign participation have an impact on the real economy, rather than uh, just to, you know, sort of a, you know, you know, borrow uh, cheap and then lend it higher or, or buy low and sell high, right? But one of the critical factors, especially along with the capital market opening and reform, is uh, this is the engine we're using market force to do price discovery, and then more importantly, to have a better asset allocation. If we look at overall gross um, you know, inputs, it is the, the human capital, uh, it is the financial capital, and then technology and uh, increasingly data, right? So with um, the key inputs, so then the asset uh, and uh, precious resources uh, can be uh, optimized and allocated to the right company so that's really uh, will be the key driver for the economy. Uh, you mentioned technology and, and data, and um, we've had a question, of course, it would come up. We've had a question about Ant, uh, Ant Financial um, from the audience. Um, and what implications do you think the uh, new regulations and, and the postponement of that listing, what implications should investors draw uh, for other companies and other financial strategies? I, I, I agree. I think Ray made a, a very good uh, comment uh, yesterday. Um, we shouldn't really uh, overread, uh, I think, the, the news. Uh, I think, in my view, uh, in many ways, uh, this uh, uh, is quite consistent with the, the Chinese policymaker uh, in terms of have that uh, growth and, and, uh, and entrepreneurship protection, but at the same time, uh, on, in a regulated uh, manner, right, and the financial industry especially uh, with regards to, to lending and a capital requirement uh, for various uh, lending uh, entities is, is a global um, uh, sort of philosophy and, and then a regulatory standard. Um, so I think I would be um, you know, not uh, overreading uh, this particular uh, event, but, but I agree, I think the timing wise, it's a bit of a surprising uh, to the, uh, many of uh, the market participants. And also the new uh, antitrust regulations in draft form that seem to be targeting some of the tech giants. Um, is that also a source of regulatory uncertainty that foreign investors should be aware of? I, I think this is also, um, in many ways, uh, a global trend. So how I think uh, regulator are looking at the, the, the in many ways, um, technology disrupting world and then balance that um, antitrust or, or the the culture and, and uh, a soil of uh, entrepreneurship, but at the same time, uh, you know, protect the, the leading players. Uh, in many ways, uh, they are, um, you know, produce as many uh, uh, patents and uh, innovative ideas as the smaller uh, player. I think it's a, it's a tough uh, balance act. I, I think it requires, uh, in many ways, uh, global exchange of uh, best practice. It is. Uh, uh, uncharted um, sort of a territory, but I think have a certain level of uh, transparency uh, and the regulations, uh, even for the tech sector, uh, it is in inevitable in China and the rest of the world. Uh, can we talk a little bit about sustainability? Uh, we've obviously had this quite bold pledge from Xi Jinping to go carbon neutral by 2060, uh, a more longer standing pledge to be uh, peak emissions, to reach peak emissions by 2030 or so. Um, is, is that realistic? I mean, given coal's dominance and uh, what investment opportunities might that create? Well, uh, um, you know, simply put it, I wouldn't bet against it. Uh, actually, if we, uh, we look at uh, um, the new investment opportunity, I'm definitely a key believer for ESG, in particular for China for environmental related investment, especially on renewable energies. 
uh, if you look at uh, other than Tesla, uh, auto related EV, um, you know, car maker, uh, you know, hitting the capital market and uh, enjoy the similar uh, growth um, uh, like Tesla and other leading players is really uh, encouraging. So, so I would think uh, China is doing the right thing in terms of uh, focusing on uh, environment and climate change. And in many ways, um, it's, um, it's not very popular um, to, from a growth of GDP, you know, you know, pure GDP growth perspective, but I think it will, um, you know, provide the system sustainability for its long-term growth. And uh, I'd be remiss not to talk a little bit about the U.S. Uh, attitude towards China. Um, how do you see that uh, affecting uh, the financial reform and uh, the opportunities for foreign investors? Um, uh, 2018, again, it was, uh, uh, you know, a unique year uh, when China's um, equity market uh, uh, suffered a downturn and also the trade war. I think overall, I think um, a Chinese investor and uh, the general public sort of learn how to uh, react and then hopefully with the, uh, the election behind us or behind us soon, it will be a more predictable uh, negotiation patterns and this will be uh, good for uh, the US and China and also uh, I think will be good for the, the overall, uh, the whole world. We did see though quite a lot of financial opening up during the Trump administration from China. Do you think there's a case to be made that the trade war helped um, precipitate and hasten some of that financial opening up? Um, the timing is uh, actually uh, quite, quite interesting. So in many ways, uh, I think uh, if, if we look at, you know, how um, uh, Mr. Deng Xiaoping uh, pushed through the reform, sometimes uh, external factor uh, does help to drive uh, uh, consensus internally. Um, oftentimes, uh, when there is a relative, uh, relatively uh, amicable uh, uh, environment, uh, there will be voices of, uh, you know, maybe you open up too, too fast and uh, uh, you're giving too much and then, you know, why uh, you, you share the pie with uh, uh, foreign players. But I think with the, um, the past uh, 18 to 24 months, I think the consensus uh, is getting stronger. Uh, China is one of the key beneficiaries for globalization. And that they definitely want to make sure uh, the coupling, especially uh, in the financial sector, will continue and strengthen to be so-called the anchor uh, for globalization. And then their next gross. And we've also had a question from the audience about uh, the virus, about the pandemic. Um, do you see that as a source of friction or, or potentially a source of um, new collaboration between China and the rest of the world? Um, I, I think it, it goes through uh, stages. Uh, at this point, I think uh, it is definitely new opportunities for uh, the world and China to collaborate. So when I was in China, there are a vaccine and a, a lot of the best practice, I would say, versus uh, you know Hong Kong. And uh, I think uh, we should definitely uh, encourage that uh, to happen in terms of more collaboration uh, rather than confrontation. Um, thank you. We've run out of time, um, but thanks. That was a, a great chat and I uh, hope you'll stay with us for the next session. Thank you. Have a good day.